attracts a lot of mines, uh, is, it, is it forcing the generator to behave in a strange way? Or is it forcing all of the generators to behave in, in sync with each other in a kind of correlation event? And, and so he, his analysis shows pretty clearly that what's going on with a, a worldwide event, something that attracts a lot of media attention, is a correlation that the, all of the generators are pushed a little bit. And that's very unexpected when you're dealing with a large random system. So this is something new that we haven't seen before in, in parapsychology. And it's because we never had a network of 65 random generators all running at once around the world. So that's one thing that's new. We're seeing a large-scale, unexpected correlations in this network. The other thing is that since we now have events occurring in locations and the random generators are distributed around the world, you can ask the question as to whether or not distance matters. And there's been an assumption for many, many years that for any kind of psi phenomena that distance doesn't matter. Well, it turns out that maybe it does. No kidding. Yeah. That really is new. Uh, I guess, you know, for some of the audience uh, not yet exposed to this, we should probably give them the basic 101 for the eggs. Okay. So, so the, if you would. The, the egg is a, an acronym that, that uh, stands for electrogiogram, which is a play on words. It's like a, an EEG, electroencephalogram. And the idea is that uh, when you're studying the brain, you put electrodes all around the brain and you pick up signals that allow you to infer what's going on inside the brain. The egg, these electrogiograms, are like electrodes that we stick all around the, the head of Gaia, the head of the world, and we infer what's going on in, in Gaia's mind as a result of these, these eggs. Now, the eggs are simply electronic circuits uh, that... Ultimately, if you trace the, uh, the source of randomness in the circuit, it comes from quantum events, typically things like electrons tunneling through barriers, that sort of thing. And the idea is that the circuit uh, can be used to do the equivalent of flipping coins quickly, randomly flipping coins. And the computer keeps track of every single flip, so you have a very accurate way of automatically keeping track of a lot of random events. All right, well, unless it's changed, um, these eggs, so-called, uh, really were computers that were random number generators sc- scattered around the world, um, correct? That's right. That's okay. right. And it, it's, it's the same idea. It, it's just a large network of these uh, eggs or random number generators running all at once. All right, and the upshot is that uh, when some big event in the world occurs, uh, 9-11 is a, a perfect example, mm-hmm. that all of a sudden these random number generators are affected, in, in, I guess in the sense that uh, they become not as random suddenly, uh, and it, it relates to the large event that occurred, 9-11 or whatever. And, and more interestingly, it seems to occur, perhaps not all the time, but frequently, prior to the large, just prior to the large event occurring. Is that still part of the model? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, uh, Peter did a very interesting analysis where uh, he went back through the entire database, which is now over 10 years of data. It's a a couple of uh, terabytes of of data or terabits. So he went back and looked for every magnitude 6 earthquake that had occurred over those 10 years, many of which were not identified as being something of interest over the course of the, the 200 and some events that we've looked at, because some of the, some magnitude 6 earthquakes occur under the ocean, and they don't produce any effect. But nevertheless, seismologists know that they occur, so there's these records. Mm-hmm. So he separated the, uh, the earthquakes, uh, the ones that occurred on land masses that would affect people, and the ones that occurred in the ocean that didn't affect people, to see whether there would be a difference. Are we dealing with human consciousness or, or fish consciousness? Uh, and what he found was that, first of all, the majority of the effect, the, the primary effect, occurred over land masses, suggesting that it has something to do with the way that we react to it. And there was virtually no res- response at all over the ocean or under the ocean. The second thing was he looked for precursor events in the, in the random network. And over land masses, you get but it looks like a, a symmetrical bump in terms of the, the lack of randomness 
where the peak of it occurs right around the time of the earthquake itself, but uh, between two and eight hours before the earthquake, there is a significant rise or a significant change in the network as though something is alerting the entire system that there's about to be an earthquake. And these are the ones that, that are seen over land masses. <laughs> That's fascinating. Um, is it possible, Dean, that um, rather than uh, reacting to uh, individual or even mass consciousness, what we're getting are signals from the Earth itself? Well, there is some evidence that... Uh, Wait a minute. I, I'm sorry. I just answered my own question. You just told me that uh, the ones that occur in the ocean are not reflected, so that would seem to suggest no, wouldn't it? Yes, although there, there are some indications that there are geomagnetic changes that occur, or magnetic changes that occur before earthquakes. But the effects that we see in the, in the generators do seem to be linked to human consciousness or at least land animal consciousness, because, right. you know, an earthquake that occurs around the ocean, even though there are whales and fish and so on, they wouldn't be affected in the same way that we are on land. For mm -hmm. them, it's, it's, a, it's a minor bump. Okay, uh, and then can it be more geographically pinpointed than that? In other words, uh, if you look at the sensors that were closest to the epicenter of the earthquake on land, do you see a bigger bump? That's where um, Peter is, has found evidence. Both, uh, not, I'm not so sure about earthquakes, but certainly for the large-scale emotional events that occur, some of which are earthquakes. Yes, there, there are bigger correlations among the random generators that are close to the events than the ones that are distant. Now, we're, wow. It, it wow. Was, we're limited to the size of the Earth, of course, in this experiment, but it looks like uh, somewhere beyond 8,000 kilometers or so, we don't, we don't get much of an effect. Most of the effect is really located close to the event itself. And back in 9-11, we, we actually did an analysis to see whether most of the statistical effect was around New York City and Washington, and we did find that at the time. Uh, but what's being, what we're seeing now is a confirmation that there does look like there's some kind of a distance effect. God, that's fascinating. Um, I, I wonder if that means that there is, uh, as with radio, for example, um, as a signal goes out, it becomes weaker. Um, so does that mean that the effect of the consciousness uh, is, is, is like a radio signal, that as it traverses whatever medium it's traversing, it slowly pays attention to relatively conventional physics and becomes weaker? Or does it mean that the people in the immediate area are simply more affected, and so their signal is more intense? Those are the two primary contenders, and we have no clear answer to that yet. But yeah, you're, you're right. If, if it turns out that we're dealing with something that has a physical component to it, like, the, like a drop-off of an electromagnetic signal, that would be really exciting, because that would begin to give us a, a clue about the nature of these events. Uh, if it turns out that it's because of greater concern for people who happen to be nearer to the event, which seems plausible, uh, well, that's also interesting because it's a secondary way of showing that we're really dealing with something like human consciousness and not, not something even more exotic than that. Huh. This is such fascinating stuff, Dean. Uh, it's just absolutely riveting. Um, so God, I, where do you go from here in, the, in this sort of research? I mean, when you begin to get these kinds of tantalizing answers... Um, you just want more and more and more, and it just doesn't come that quickly because I know the analysis of all this data takes time. It, it's uh, partially an analytical problem, but it's, it's largely a problem of the lack of people who are interested in, in the project. What's the matter with them? I, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we've been talking and writing, and, you know, there, there's a lot of interest. That, of course, among some scientists, they, they, they can't get beyond the first two sentences. They say, well, this is completely ridiculous. There's no way to even imagine how such a thing could exist, and so they just dismiss it. And, and that's uh, unfortunate, but, you know, that's, that's what happens. Well, that's all it is for you. Um, all right, Dean, just rest for a moment. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Dean Radin is my guest, and this really is, in my opinion, the most fascinating topic ever discussed on Coast to Coast AM. Imagine a power that could uh, change anything you wish 
changed. I'm Art Bell. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, or evening, whatever. Uh, listen, for those of you who didn't catch the beginning of the program, 